becomes a dream. The dream becomes a world. Is twofold. Sleep hath its own world, a boundary between the things misnamed death and existence. Sleep hath its own world, and a wide realm of wild reality. And dreams in their development have breath, and tears, and tortures, and the touch of joy. They leave a weight upon our waking thoughts. They take a weight from off our waking toils. They do divide our being. They become a portion of ourselves as of our time and look like heralds of eternity. They pass like spirits of the past. They speak like sibyls of the future. They have power, the tyranny of pleasure and of pain. They make us what we were not, what they will, and shake us with a vision that's gone by, the dread of vanished shadows. Are they so? Is not the past all shadow? What are they? Creations of the mind? The mind can make substance and people planets of its own with beings brighter than have been and give a breath to forms which can outlive all flesh. I would recall a vision which I dreamed perchance in sleep for in itself a thought a slumbering thought is capable of years and curdles a long life into one hour. Lord Byron's The Dream is the romantic manifesto on dreams, elevating what had previously been regarded as a quirky and irrational hiccup in the conscious life of the civilized human being into the very fount of creativity. The dream became an essential part of the armory of any self-respecting writer or poet or painter, tantalizingly offering the prospect of a rich and extraordinary imagery plucked from the depths of the subconscious. More often, I imagine, offering only the somewhat shop-soiled and banal imagery that most of us encounter in our sleep. The romantics clung to the notion of the dream as a way of delving into a pool of images and ideas that lay beyond their conscious grasp. But the vivid, illuminating dream experience they sought was impossible to order, to control, or indeed to summon up when needed. Most of the poets of the Romantic period kept dream notebooks, recording their dreams as a way of holding on to the purest images of poetry. Dreams were as essential for the Romantic writer as pen and paper. And when one's dreams were impoverished, one's whole worth as a poet seemed to be in doubt. The writer Charles Lamb gave vent to his jealousy of Coleridge's apparently effortless ability to summon up dreams of dazzling richness and grandeur and irreproachable authenticity. There is Coleridge. At his will can conjure up icy domes and pleasure houses for Kublai Khan and Abyssinian maids and songs of Abra and caverns where Alf the sacred river runs to solace his night's solitudes. Where I cannot muster a fiddle. My stretch of imaginative activity can hardly, in the night season, raise up the ghost of a fishwife. What better way to judge aspiring poets than to ask, young man, what sort of dreams have you? The world becomes a dream. The dream becomes a world.
dusk, in the haunting half-light in which day becomes night, dreams begin to unfurl. A life free of the constraints of our daytime existence is about to begin. For the romantics, dusk is the doorway to a more subtle and stimulating world than that offered by daytime reality. Day is only the gross companion to night. In his poems, Hymns to the Night, Novalis creates profoundly melancholy cadences of anguished ecstasy and passionate grief that draw no distinction between dream and life. Reality becomes grey, intangible. The brief joys and vain hopes of one's whole long life come in grey garments, like evening mists after sunsets. The world becomes a dream. The dream becomes a world. I turn away towards the holy, unutterable, mysterious night. Far off lies the world, submerged in a deep vault, desolate and lonely in its sojourn. The strings of my heart are moved by a profound melancholy, I want to dissolve into the dew and mingle with the ash. Remote memories, the desires of my youth, the dreams of my childhood, the brief joys and vain hopes of my whole life come dressed in grey garments like evening mists after sunsets. Light has pitched its gay tents elsewhere. Would it never return to its children who wait with the faith of the innocent? You lift the soul's heavy wings. I see a calm face which watches me in tender solicitude. And beneath the mass of curls, it is my mother in her youth. Poor and childish light seems now. How joyful and blessed the close of day. For the child, the attentive and loving mother is the last bastion between him and the unknown monsters who lurk beneath the cloak of sleep and darkness. Musician, night is the territory of purest enchantment. Images spawned by sleep and death and dreams underlie the poetry of John Keats. In La Belle Dame Sans Merci, the dream leads to a terror land of phantoms that threaten to engulf the poet. I saw their starved lips in the gloom with horrid warning gaped wide. In Endymion, Keats calls sleep the key to golden palaces and bespangled caves. But in his long poem, 
sleep and poetry. He raises sleep to the honored position of nature and poetry in one. What? More secret than a nest of nightingales? More serene than Cordelia's countenance? More full of visions than a high romance? What but thee sleep? Soft closer of our eyes, low murmurer of tender lullabies, light hoverer around our happy pillows, wreather of poppy buds and weeping willows. William Blake illustrates an edition of Edward Young's Night Thoughts. Figures lie entwined in sleep's tendrils and are visited by the powerful spirits of their dreams. In the art of the Romantics, in their writing and their paintings, their plays and diaries, sleep, night and dreams appear sometimes in this tender benevolent form. More often, they are the trigger for alarming, morbid, violent and often erotic images that ripped apart the considered coherent world of the 18th century. Night and sleep spring the child out of the charmed circle of his mother's loving watchfulness. Now he soars through great spaces with the rapturous carelessness of an Icarus. The boy traverses gulfs of night with the wild abandon of creatures imagined by Goya. But it is Goya, however, who curbs his pleasure by conjuring up from the darkness a pitiless ogre. any other painter knows how to release the demons of sleep. Burnt into the plates of his etchings, they assail the sleeper, powerless now in the grip of his dreams. Sleep 
hath its own world, says Byron. The Romantics insisted on the significance of that other world until the dream world eclipsed the waking world. Reality was the illusion. Dream became the essential truth. The dreamer has shaken off the physical constraints of his body and gives himself up to the irrational lucidity of his mind. The dream, operating according to its own laws, reveals to us unmentionable desires in a strange and rich chaos. The Swiss painter Fuseli plunges with delight into the infernal swamps where lie buried the secret anxieties of the soul. pulverize the narrow limits set by reason, the romantics turn with excitement to the boundless empires of dreams. In beauty and in horror, the dream offers us all at once the earth and heaven and hell. In sleep, the sleeper finds himself face to face with the unconscious and uncontrollable contradictions of his soul. In her dreams, the sleeper is attracted by bestial creatures that at the same time repulse and frighten her. sudden she transforms into a Lady Macbeth with the bloody hands and crazed look she wears in the painting by Fuseli. But in the very heart of her terror she finds enough mercy to absolve herself from hideous crimes and, forgiven, rises to the sublime heights of Friedrich's Calvary, cleaving the ceiling of the world on a mountain peak. Seven league boots, the child strides across desolate forests where lurk imaginary, invisible but menacing monsters.
For the Romantics, the dream took on an allure and an importance that it had never had before. On a superficial level, the cult of the dream resulted in a good deal of hocus-pocus in poems and paintings that are essentially confections, collections of vaguely gothic or bizarre props. The real article was eagerly sought after, and there survives a collection of recipes for the provocation of interesting dreams. Mrs. Radcliffe ate vast amounts of rich, indigestible food to fuel the dreams of terror that groaned and creaked their way through her novels. Tennyson believed that a meal of meat after six weeks of vegetarianism produced unforgettable dreams. Byron preferred copious drafts of coffee and alcohol. But it was opium, usually drunk as laudanum, that held out to the romantic poet and visionary the fatal promise of unending dream powers. But that often created instead viper thoughts that coil around my mind, reality's dark dream. There is one glowing example of an opium-induced dream made into art. Coleridge's Kubla Khan. The poet has himself documented its genesis, beginning with a precise time, place, and account of the surrounding circumstances. In the summer of the year 1797, in ill health, I retired to a lonely farmhouse between Porlock and Linton, on the Exmoor confines of Somerset and Devonshire. In consequence of a slight indisposition, an anodyne had been prescribed, from the effects of which I fell asleep in my chair. So far, so good. Coleridge woke after about three hours in a profound sleep in which all the images rose before me as things without any sensation of consciousness of effort. Immediately on waking, he began to write. The sonorous opening lines of Kubla Khan appeared on his paper. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. But alas, the poem is at once an embodiment of the power that dreams can attain in the imagination of a genius, and a demonstration of how unreliable is the dream as a vehicle of creative invention. It arrives unheralded, and without warning, it vanishes, never to be recovered. The full title that Coleridge gave to his dream vision was Kubla Khan, or a vision in a dream, a fragment. A fragment because as he was writing down the still vivid imagery in his mind's eye, he was interrupted by a person on business from Porlock and detained for over an hour. When I returned to my room, I found to my surprise and mortification that though I retained some vague and dim recollection of the general vision, the rest had passed away like the images on the surface of a stream into which a stone had been cast. For the rest of his life, Coleridge meant to finish Kubla Khan. He never did. Midnight, the peak of night when the Prince of Darkness, taking the form of Mephisto, stirs irrational fears. Fugitives from death's long trance invade the sleep of a fearful child. Even when childhood is long past, the terrors of sleep do not abate. Phantoms still cling to the imagination, tormenting the helpless victim who comes to fear their nightly arrival. had ceased. The vision fled. Yet still I gasped and reeled with dread, 
And ever when the dream of night renews the phantom to my sight, cold sweat drops gather on my limbs. But yesternight I prayed aloud in anguish and in agony, upstarting from the fiendish crowd of shapes and thoughts that tortured me. A lurid light, a trampling throng, sense of intolerable wrong, and whom I scorned, those only strong. Here is the dreadful spirit of night at sea. The ghosts of the graves of sailors swallowed by the tempest. From his eerie in Guernsey, Victor Hugo gazes into the great mouth of darkness that yawns open at his feet. The winds, fear the night winds. Where are they taking us? Those led by dreams become themselves dreams. And without willing it, are swallowed up by a dark swarm of intangible faces. The night, like still, dark water rising in an urn, swells and absorbs by degrees the forests, slopes, the grasses and the trees, and as it rises to the rim, fills up the entire horizon. Victor Hugo traces through his drawings a dark inventory of destruction and death laced with a grim humor. The drawings are not planned, but grow. Starting from pools of ink on paper, Hugo allows his unconscious mind to bring him images. The results are as mysterious as the spirits who speak to him in seances. Dusk grew turbulent with fire before me. And like a windy arras waved with dreams. Sleep I took not for my bedfellow who could waken to a revel. An inexhaustible wassail of orgiac imageries. Obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an Eidolon named Night on a black throne reigns upright. I have reached these lands but newly, from an ultimate dim fuel, from a wild, weird clime that lieth sublime, out of space, out of time. a nocturnal path that runs by the chasms of death? Does the mask of the sleeper foreshadow the mask that eternal sleep will clamp on him? Sleep is a transitory death 
allowing the dreamer to glimpse in vertiginous visions the future horrors of hell. of the earth, Gustave Doré shows us Dante and Virgil tirelessly pursuing their anguished quest. John Martin turns the architecture of London sewers into labyrinthine cities of night. Here, grim granite walls and stairways reflect the baleful glow of thousands of torches. In the rich blacks of his etchings, hell and the garden of paradise wrap around us. The Romantic's night is an impenetrable darkness that commands us to enter. With vast forests and halls and caves and dungeons, it winds its spell around us. The Gothic novel creaks open on rusty hinges. A deep abyss now presented itself before them, whose thick obscurity the eyes strove to pierce in vain. The rays of the lamp were too feeble to be of much assistance. Nothing was discernible, save a flight of rough, unshapen steps which sank into the yawning gulf and were soon lost in darkness. The groans were heard no more, but all believed them to have ascended from this cavern. I slept in the dark, in the silent night. I murmured my fears, and I felt delight. In the morning I went as rosy as morn, to seek for new joy, but I met with scorn. comes, the romantic is thrown rudely back from night enchantments into an unsympathetic world.
Silent, silent night, quench the holy light of thy torches bright. For possessed of day, thousand spirits stray that sweet joys betray. Terrors of night have not been undergone in vain. Even silent night proclaims my soul immortal. Even silent night proclaims eternal day. For human weal, heaven husbands all events. Dull sleep instructs nor sport vain dreams in vain. The true path is the one that leads to the interior. At daybreak, the romantic dreamer experiences a sense of loss and confusion. I no longer knew what I was or where I was. I no longer had human thoughts. I was neither sad nor happy. For the moment, the world had disappeared into the abyss. I was alone. At the outer edge of darkness, while the nocturnal sky is already growing pale, the life of day begins to awake in a myriad subtle shiverings. Little by little, the romantic is cast out of the chasm of night. Sleepless nights are a source of exhilarating inspiration. Byron rebelled against the whole notion of sleep. Magnificent night, you were not given to man for sleeping. Night is the depth of the indestructible knowledge of God. It is through night that the romantic discovers himself. And it is through his own darkness that the enigma of night is eventually decoded. the most successful use of dreams was in the works of artists who did not distinguish between dream and waking sensations. For them, there existed no distinction between rational and irrational, between the physical and the imaginative reality. For these artists, night or day had no bearing on their ability to create images that have a super real intensity and charge. William Blake had no need of dreams to meet his ghost of a flea. He saw it. But even Blake, like Coleridge and Wordsworth, suffered for many years during which inspiration seemed withheld. For Blake, at least, it returned. Suddenly, I was again enlightened with the light I enjoyed in my youth, and which has for exactly 20 years been closed from me as by a door and by window shutters.
becomes a dream. The dream becomes a world. As night gives way to day, a sense of radiant exultation springs up from the romantic's inner night. Before the weary round of life starts up again. <laughs> 